In Ezekiel chapter 1, the prophet said, The heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. In Acts chapter 10, we are told that Peter, in the middle of a rooftop prayer time, saw the sky opened up. In the early verses of 2 Corinthians 12, Paul wrote that he was caught up to the third heaven, caught up into paradise where he heard inexpressible words. John seems to have had a similar experience in the Revelation. Check out verses 9 and 10. I, John, your brother and fellow participant in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. Now, there are several things I want you to notice about John and his early experience in this encounter. First, I want you to notice John's position. It was a position of worship. John happened to be worshiping on the Lord's Day, a Sunday, the first day of the week. So what is the significance? Well, we learn here that even though John had been engulfed by tribulation, though he suffered from physical exhaustion, though he had been exiled to a place beyond the farthest fringes of civilized society, John worshiped the Lord on the one day in every week that believers are called to gather and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Worship in his circumstance and his environment must have been difficult. Yet John disciplined himself to lift his heart and face toward God. Even though he had been caught up in the throes of tribulation, still he chose to worship God on the first day of the week. John considered worship not as an option, but rather as a responsibility as well as a privilege. John viewed worship not as a convenience, but rather as a commitment. John thought worship not to be an afterthought or a second thought, but a first thought, what might be called a consuming thought. Now, I am the first to admit that God does not always lift us out of ourselves and speak to us in unusual ways. There are many Sundays that may not be remarkable in terms of worship. However, I suggest today that a casual attitude toward worship can clog the channels of spiritual communication. I suggest that a nonchalant Apathetic posture in regard to the adoration and the praise of God can and does hinder the possibility of a transcendent experience in corporate worship. God seldom seeks to communicate with those who seldom seek to communicate with him. Though John had every reason to absent himself from worship, yet here he is worshiping God. Here he is praising God. Here he is in moments of adoring God. Here he is obeying God. As a result, on this particular occasion, God removed John's earthly limitations and opened his inner eye to the heavenly temple. Somehow, God lifted John out of himself and spoke to him in an extraordinary fashion. This magnificent experience did not happen on every occasion of worship, but John could have decided to stay in bed on this particular day. John could have decided to spend the day at the beach. John could have decided to entertain relatives for the weekend. A person never knows when God is going to break through. A person never knows when the sky, so to speak, is going to open up. 
A person never knows when God's voice is going to peal from the halls of heaven like claps of thunder. How terrible to think that the very worship hour someone neglected to attend just might, just might, just might have held that critical life-changing message. Those who consider the worship experience to be an unbreakable appointment with God and with his people are not often disappointed. So first, I wanted you to notice John's position. Second, I want you to notice John's posture. It was a posture of spirituality. Look at verse 10 again. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, what did John mean by being in the Spirit on the Lord's day? Well, I think that he had meant that he had prepared himself mentally and emotionally to hear God. He meant that he had actually primed himself to see with his spiritual eyes. He meant that he arrived at the place of worship ready for the encounter. In 1845, the Franklin Expedition tramped through the polar ice and snow in search of the pole of what was then called relative inaccessibility. That imaginary point on the Arctic Ocean farthest from land in any direction. 138 officers and men carried a 1,200 volume library, a hand organ, China place settings for each person, cut glass goblets, sterling silverware, but no one took insulated clothing for the Arctic environment. They wore only the uniforms of Her Majesty's Navy. Would you be surprised to learn that all 138 men died? Well, of course not. But why? Because they arrived at the Arctic unprepared. When we arrive at this place of worship, as all of us here today have indeed done, or any place of worship, do we not arrive searching for, looking for, and longing for God to enter our experience in some marvelous way? And if that is true, then would it make a difference coming to this place prepared and ready for spiritual interaction? Coming dressed for the occasion, so to speak, can be extremely helpful. Some climb in bed so late on Saturday night that they enter the place of worship fighting off fatigue. Has that ever happened to anyone here? Did it happen to anyone here this morning? The answer is probably yes. It's easy for the Sunday morning hours before church to be filled with anything and everything other than spiritual preparation. For some... Their deepest thought is trying to remember what they wore last Sunday so as not to wear the same thing two weeks in a row. Because we know that would be a tragedy of epic proportions. And there are those who rise on Sunday morning and they turn on some Sunday morning news program. My suggestion is never to watch the news much less on Sunday morning. If I watch the news, I always come away grumpy. I always come away growling. I always come away with some kind of anger because of what is going on in our world. It is especially tough on parents who spend Sunday morning wrestling with the kids and arguing with one another as to who's not being helpful enough. No prayer, no contemplation of biblical truth, no solitary quietness that focuses the mind heavenward. 
Consequently, many come through these doors to stand at the well of living water, but have no bucket with which to draw. First, notice John's position. Second, notice John's posture. Check out verse 10. It indeed was a posture of surprise. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. The voice was not a trumpet, but John likened it to a trumpet in that it was clear, in that it was distinct, in that it was intelligible, in that it was compelling. The ancients used the trumpet to call the people together, to sound the charge into battle. But most of all, the ancients used the trumpet to proclaim a message of triumph. John had barely started taking notes for the revelation. And already he is to understand that the severe tribulation uh, through which the church was passing would end in victory for God's people. God is not going to lose the war that rages between the world and the true followers of his son. And isn't it true that we in America are just now beginning to feel the pinchers of what appears to be a rapidly rising tide of anti-Christian hostility. Isn't it true? Paul looked forward to the end and he saw that victory would be ours. He wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. One well-meaning Christian who had been hammered by a fierce trial misquoted a phrase of Scripture but found great comfort in the words. He said, I'm so glad the Bible tells us it came to pass and not it came to stay. Misquoted Scripture but well-quoted truth. In the end... God wins. And because God wins, we win with Him. The trumpet is the instrument of the church. The trumpet is the instrument that we are to hear day by day as we march through this earthly warfare. I call your attention to verse 11. Write out or write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Through the Apostle John, Jesus addressed the congregations of seven churches located in the ancient Roman province of Asia Minor. This particular region is known today as Turkey. Now, there are those who believe that each of these congregations represented a different period in the history of the church from the first century right up to the moment in which we live in the 21st century. One writer said they portray prophetically seven distinct consecutive periods of church history from the cross at Calvary to the crown in glory. Now, according to that view, the church at Ephesus is to be viewed as the church of the first century, the church in its purest condition, the apostolic church. Church Smyrna is to be seen as the persecuted church of the second and third centuries. Pergamos is said to represent the church of in the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries, the centuries that saw the church become bedfellows with the state. Thyatira, according to this view, is supposedly the symbol of the church in the Dark Ages, the church that gave way to the rise and the power of the papacy, the church that persecuted small bands of believers who held firm to the perfect priesthood of Christ. Sardis is portrayed by those who hold to this view as the church of the Renaissance and the Reformation. The church that brought Christianity out of its medieval quagmire. 
Philadelphia then, according to this view, is taken to be the church of the 17 and 1800s. The church that experienced sweeping revival. The church set on fire for world missions. And then finally, Laodicea is said to be the church of the end times. The church of apostasy. The church that is rich but rotten. The church that is lavish but lifeless. The present day church, the modern church that boasts of great methods but has no message. Now this view is extremely interesting to say the least, and for some, it is a most compelling view. And I'm not saying in any way that this interpretation is incorrect. However, I happen to hold a somewhat different view. I believe that the revelation was meant first for the churches of the first century, not for the churches of the second century or the third and fourth century, not for the churches of the medieval times, not for the churches of the Renaissance and the Reformation, and not for the churches that were in revival and not even for the modern day church. First, the revelation was meant for the churches of the first century. When Jesus said, write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, he addressed that letter to seven quantified churches in the first century. Jesus had a specific message for seven local congregations of the first century. Is it possible that Jesus sent the revelation to the churches of the first century, but that he actually meant its message only for the churches of the distant future? If that is true, then just close up the revelation in the first century because it meant nothing. But the Bible is a magnificent collection of God-inspired writings penned by more than 40 authors over 1,500 years. Every book in the Bible was meant first for the original recipients in whatever their situation or cultural milieu happened to be. It is only in understanding each book's original message that we can understand what the message means for us. Can it be imagined that the ferocity of the early church's plight wasn't that ferocious and needed no answer? Or that the answer had a 2,000 year time delay? Is it conceivable that a doctor might prescribe medication for a patient with some severe condition and then tell that patient not to take it for say 2,000 years? If the revelation was not a word for the recipients of John's treatise first, then how can it be a word for us today? It is in unraveling Christ's message for them that we are best able to unravel Christ's message for us. Someone has said that many people are looking feverishly for traces of the revelations antichrist and beast in our modern world. And I do not see anything wrong with that. But if biblical history tells us anything, it tells us that the first century had the footprints of the Antichrist and the beast all over it as well. John had already written in his first epistle, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is or does not confess Jesus, is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and now is already in the world. So I believe the revelation was meant first for the church of the first century. I also believe that the seven congregations mentioned in verse 11 and addressed in chapters 2 and 3 represent the entire church for all time, beginning with the then and coming forward to the now. The number seven is the biblical number for completeness. 
So separately and corporately, the description of these churches demonstrates the conditions and the characteristics of the church in every century since Jesus established the church. Select any time frame from the last 2,000 years and you will find congregations who mirror the images presented in the churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Laodicea. The revelation given to John had meaning. Not merely for a church in one particular century or another. Rather, the revelation given to John brings a message of comfort and inspiration and hope and correction to every church in every century. And especially to those churches who find themselves pressed beneath the stinging blows of a world that is hostile to the things of God. And it is a powerful life-changing message and therefore it is a message for us today in the good old U.S. of A. Of course, not everyone feels that way about the Revelation. In his book, chapter and verse, A Skeptic Revisits Christianity, Mike Bryan wrote, Revelation makes the modern reader wonder what kind of men were these first century proselytizers for God. Can we understand them and their surrealistic view at all? The book of Revelation, he said, is impossible for any but the most committed to pay attention uh, to today. In line with my recommendation, he said, that the potential Christian not begin his or her study of faith with Genesis, the first book of the Bible, I would go beyond that and suggest that the last book of the Bible be removed from the Bible altogether. It cannot speak meaningfully meaningfully to most of us, including most Christians. So says a non-believer. That assessment, of course, is in direct contradiction to the third verse of Revelation 1, blessed is the one who reads, and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things that are written in it, for the time is near. Now what does that tell us? It tells us that intimate knowledge of the revelation gives us power for any conflict encouragement for any grind, and expectancy and ultimate victory in any and every circumstance. Thus, it is meant for us as well. Granted, the revelation is not the easiest biblical material to interpret. I might slide it in right behind the, behind the book of Hebrews, which we are studying on when, in Wednesday night worship. And granted, there are differing views as well as various disagreements about the revelation's precise meaning, yet the effort to understand and apply its meaning is a worthwhile endeavor of huge proportions. I want us now to look at one of the most interesting phrases in the Bible. It is found in the A part of verse 12. Notice it. John said, I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. Is that not fascinating? John turned to see the voice. Really? How does a person see a voice? Well, actually, I think the idea here is that voices in their tones, in their volumes, in their cadences, in their paces, establish certain expectations. And especially if someone is standing behind you, and let's say they speak in a deep, surly voice, does it not produce expectations of a bad-tempered, meaninglessly, menacingly irritable person? Yes, it does, doesn't it? And instead of turning around to see that voice, you just take off in the opposite direction. Likewise, a deep, mellow tone produces expectations of an authoritative, but gentle person and then a high squeak 
squeaky voice usually brings to mind a small, non-threatening person whose appearance looks like a clown. (laughs) And isn't it the same with the dog? Most of us somewhere on the way have knocked on a door and have heard a bark on the other side, right? Anybody done that? Yes, of course we have. Instinctively, because we are geniuses, we recognize that is a dog. (laughs) However, what kind of dog is it? Well, the voice of the dog gives us a pretty good indication. There is the ankle biter kind of bark. Then there is the let me lick your face kind of bark. And then there is the step inside this door and I'll chew your arm off kind of bark. So what kind of expectations did the voice of the revelator, chapter 1, produce in John's heart and in his mind? We already know that it was a loud voice. In fact, it was loud like the blast of a trumpet. The kind of loud that demands attention immediately. The kind of loud that makes a person turn the head quickly and take notice. Is it possible to imagine John's anticipation as he made that speedy turn? What do you suppose he expected to see? What manner of person or creature stood behind him that possessed such a resounding, imposing, and commanding voice? Well, as John turned, verse 12 tells us that he saw neither person nor creature, but instead seven lampstands. So what is the significance of the lampstands? The revelation is filled with images. And it is not the images that are to be taken literally, but the truth behind the images. So what do the lampstands mean? What is their significance? Verse 20 tells us. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the lampstands are symbolic of the church. As lampstands, we are to see that the function of the church is to operate as God's light-giving apparatus to a world of spiritual darkness. In Matthew 5, Jesus said to his followers, You are the light of the world. Then he ran right in behind that by referring to his followers as the kind of light placed on top of a hill rather than hidden in some out-of-the-way inconspicuous place. He referred to the kind of light that enables, and I quote, everyone in the house to see. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul said, Be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as among whom you appear as? We're not there yet. <laughs> among whom you appear as lights in the world. The purpose of the church is to be a light bearing instrument. Did you know that when you pull out of when you pulled out of your driveway this morning and you began coming to church? That trip, that automobile, that pulling out of your driveway was a witness to everyone who was bathing their dog or washing their car or cutting their toenails. You were a witness. I'm part of the church. And I'm going to join other believers at church. It is a witness. This building is a witness. Of, of the light of Christ. I've had many people say to me, I will pass by this facility and something in me says, I need to stop. I need to worship there. I need to go in that place and see what's going on. Just the building itself is a light. 
Can we justify our existence except that we are presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ to our community and then doing what we can to support gospel efforts around the world, either by going ourselves, which we have done, or by funding those who do, which we participate in every week. Is that not true for every believer? as well as to the quote-unquote church? And if not comprised of believers with hearts for being light to its community and world, then what is the church but a lifeless, dead, purposeless organization? Does our purpose statement located in our foyer not reflect this magnificent truth of the revelation? And does anyone here have that statement committed to memory? The purpose of Countryside Baptist Church is to serve as a pathway of the kingdom to families, friends, communities, the nation, and the world. That's us. That's who we are. That's what we do. Everything is guided by that purpose statement. And then if you care to go to that side of our for you, you will see the five ways we fulfill our purpose. And if you go to the right side, that side of the for you, you will see how we are identified as a congregation. You'll see our structure. It's easy to see that the revelation addresses not only the role of the church in some future moment, but also the task of the church in every present moment. Note also that these lampstands are golden. That refers to the purity of the church's function. There is to be no mixture, no alloy, and no dross. All is to be geared toward advancing the kingdom, and everything we do has some part in advancing the kingdom of God. We might say it like this. The main thing is to be kept the main thing. It is easy to get out in the weeds and forget the main thing. We discovered last week that the revelation is centered in and around Christ. This week we discovered that the revelation is is addressed to the church. And the church is to remain focused on its Christ-given task even as tribulation comes upon it and even more as the forces behind the tribulation encompass the church and perhaps seem to be on the verge of scrubbing the church and its people right out of existence. And do not think there's not a move to do that very thing right here in America today. The revelation was pinned in the midst of tribulation. The church faced tribulation then. And if the church is facing tribulation today or is about to face tribulation, then it is time to prepare ourselves for it. How? Well, how did first century believers get through it? How did they face it? And if we can answer those questions, is, not, is that not exactly how we are to get through it and how we are to face it? So how do we start? First, start with Jesus Christ. He is at the center. For those who have not yet connected to Christ, that means connecting to Christ. That means presenting oneself to Him and inviting Him to take the throne of one's heart and one's life. The tribulation has started. It is coming. No one will make it through without Jesus Christ. Connect to Him. 
and even for the person who is a believer. Starting with Christ means trusting Him in every circumstance. Now let me ask you something. If we cannot trust Him with all that is going on in our lives today, how will we ever trust Him in the midst of tribulation? We would be a farce. Trusting Jesus now, no matter what happens. Sticking with Jesus now, come what may. It starts with trusting Jesus and becoming like Him. Well, that's good if we're talking about the baby Jesus. But what if we're talking about the suffering servant that Isaiah prophesied about? What if we're talking about the Christ who was brutally beaten and despised and mocked and savagely killed and hung on a cross? What then? I don't know if I'm in for that. I would suggest that it is something to be contemplating because I tell you it's coming. Becoming like Him. Did you know that most every one of His inner circle, did you know that most every one of those men were martyred for their faith? Are we up for that? Are we? Third, or second rather, I'm sorry. Actively engaging with believers who comprise the church. You know what that means? Two words, hanging out. It means hanging out with strong, enthusiastic men and women who love God. Hanging out with men and women who have a terrific influence on your life and my life in regard to the kingdom. Just hanging out. In fact, did you know that's my ministry philosophy? I just hang out with the folks. That, that's what I do. I hang out. Somebody, somebody said to me not long ago, said, you know, the way you preach in the pulpit is just, man, it's just, it can't even be described. And then you come down off that platform and you're just one of the guys. I'm just one of the guys. We hang out. We become like those with whom we hang out. Who are our confidants? Who are our best friends? Who are our trusted companions? Engaging believers. Third, studying and learning from the first century church. And this is exactly what we are doing and what we are going to do as we move through this magnificent treatise. We are going to learn from them. And God says, if you will take the time to learn from them, you're going to be highly blessed. You know what that means? See if you can handle this. That means coming back to hear me preach again. Can, can you handle that? That means getting serious, not just about who they were, but about who we are. That's what it means. So, in just a few moments, I'm going to be standing at that high top table just to the right. Pastor Dan will be there. Pastor Nick will be there. 
And if you have any interest at all in connecting with Jesus Christ and turning your life over to Him, we would like to help you make that decision. We will not bite you. We are not ankle biters. We will not chew your arms off. I don't know. Dan might lick your face, but I'll try to hold him back. Just come and let's, let's talk about that. Putting faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Or becoming a member of this, of this fellowship, this ministry. Folks, we are dead serious in our faith, but we enjoy each other and we have a great time every time we meet. And people want to keep coming back. And maybe it's time to become a member of this local fellowship. Join me to the right in just a few moments. And buckle down. Buckle down on the wild ride called the Revelation. It's going to change our lives. Let's pray together. Father, this is your moment like are all moments. We belong to you. Some of us just don't know it yet. You have all things in your hands. And we know based on your word that times of tribulation come. And it seems that there is an expectation in the air among those in the church that we're on the verge of that. <coughs> Well, we've got to get ready. And what better way than this? Lord, some today becoming ready for the first time by connecting to Christ. Some growing stronger in their connection by engaging with believers who are excited about their faith. So Lord, there's some decisions that are being made, that will be made. I pray decisions that will bring honor and glory to you and not one person, not one person will leave this place today without connecting to you or to this church family. We are your servants preparing ourselves for what is to come. And we pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand again.